Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Koenig, and I serve as the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego. Thank you so much for joining us for the next lecture in our series of evidence-based medicine presentations. Today, we are pleased to welcome Flavio Nominati, Deputy District Attorney for the County of San Diego, to speak on one of the hottest topics in America, human trafficking. Specifically, DDA Nominati will talk about the effects of COVID and Title 42 on the management of human trafficking. Serving as prosecutor for approximately 11 years, Mr. Nominati has been assigned to numerous specialized units. He's the executive chair of the San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force, where he serves as the team leader for the Sex Crimes and Human Trafficking Division, supervising approximately 10 task force officers and 10 deputy district attorneys. We are so thrilled to welcome such a highly qualified speaker today to share knowledge with us on this important topic. Thank you so much and over to you, Deputy District Attorney Nominati. Thank you, Dr. Koenig. I appreciate the presentation um, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with all of you. Hopefully um, you guys could see this. So just give me one second. Can someone give me a thumbs up? I'm assuming everyone could see this, but I just want to make sure. Looks good. Looks good? Great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, like Dr. Koenig said, um, this is an incredibly hot topic right now. And, and, and human trafficking normally is a, a very hot topic. But for some reason, uh, th these last few months, we've seen such a increase in the amount of information, the amount of tips that we get here at the task force uh, that it's been unlike any other time that I have been here at the task force. So that it's interesting how, how this has spiked uh, as of late. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the Human Trafficking Task Force is a task force that uh, oversees any human trafficking investigations that occur within the County of San Diego. Uh, we are comprised of all uh, the police agencies, primarily all the police agencies here uh, in the County of San Diego to include the San Diego Police Department, San Diego Sheriffs. Uh, we have National City. Uh, we have uh, um, the California Highway Patrol, and we also have a few uh, federal agencies that we work with as well, the FBI, Homeland Security. We have not just a state prosecutor myself, we have a federal prosecutor on the task force, but really the aim of our task force is to gather as much information on investigations and general information as to trends that we see in human trafficking uh, across our county. And so today we're going to talk a little bit of what those effects of COVID have been as it relates to, and let me just go here, as it relates to uh, human trafficking investigations in particular, as it relates to human trafficking prosecution and the general increase in human trafficking we have seen after COVID. Uh, we'll talk about generally the scope of this uh, issue, the scope of human trafficking within our state, within, within our country. Um, I'll go over a little bit of the law as it stands here in, uh, in California related to prosecutions and investigations of human trafficking. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about um, these new laws and uh, both laws that have been enacted, laws that have been taken away, but really the, the key focus of our conversation are going to be laws that have really, um, I'm not going to uh, say the word enabled, but really have created a bigger human trafficking issue in our county and across the state. And so there's two in particular that we're gonna talk about. Obviously the title of the presentation is uh, Title 42, but there are uh, there is another law that is, if not more important, equally important as that drastic change. Finally, we're gonna conclude our conversation this afternoon on how we can identify victims of human trafficking and how we can interact with victims of human trafficking, uh, particularly in each of your practices 
Um, uh, certainly here at the Human Trafficking Task Force, we undergo trainings to ensure that the method in which we interact with victims of human trafficking uh, encompasses understanding their trauma and understanding what this crime actually does to a victim, something hopefully I'll be able to articulate to you this afternoon in order to know when and how to appropriately interact with them uh, in a way that uh, is inviting for them to be able to share their experience. So let's talk about generally what this, what this crime uh, generates worldwide, what this crime generates uh, in, our, in our country. And when we see these numbers, um, it is absolutely staggering to see uh, how much money is generated out of the exploitation of human beings. Um, it is, uh, when you think about it in these figures, you think, well, how on earth can that much money be generated out of this? How, how is that even humanly possible? And uh, I'll try my best to explain that to you because one of the things that we learned through our investigations, and we had a recent one as of late where we were able to identify a suspect of human trafficking who had three individuals uh, that he was exploiting sexually. And uh, each of these individuals were required to report back to him at the conclusion of their evening with $2,000 in cash. If they did not have the $2,000 in cash, they were not allowed to come back home. They were not allowed to go to the hotel room. They were not allowed to eat. They had to literally stay outside until they made the amount of money necessary to come back inside. That is how insidious this crime is. And that is how much, if you think about it, this person was doing this with three individuals every single day of the week, in the county, out of the county, in another city, in another state, the amount of money this individual was generating over that. And you see up here that uh, it's, it's, it's behind drug dealing. I anticipate that, that to flip soon because this is a crime that unlike drug deals, we don't have units that are sold and then we need to buy more units to sell. This is an individual, this is a person that is sold primarily in a sex trafficking. We'll talk a little bit about that. But there's also labor trafficking. And that individual can be bought and sold and bought and sold over and over and over and over again against their will. And so it's not like drug deals where once you run out of the merchandise, it's gone. This is a person. This is a real life human being that can be bought and sold in perpetuity. And so um, we've seen a great deal of impact uh, after COVID happened in the increased number of juveniles that have been involved um, and victims of this crime. Pre-COVID, we, we certainly were reporting that we were able to recover uh, young minors that were uh, had fallen victim to this particular uh, criminal offense. But after COVID, those numbers spiked, uh, doubled, doubled the amount of reports, the amount of tips that we received for child exploitation, and more importantly, the amount of young victims that we recovered as victims of human trafficking doubled. And um, we've... I can't tell you a single case that I am currently either assisting in the investigation or prosecuting where the trafficker did not first meet their victim on some form of online app, whether that be Snapchat, whether that be Instagram, whether that be Facebook Messenger. 95%, and I'm sure you can appreciate this being doctors, I do not uh, operate in guarantees. I try to give percentages. Uh, I try not to give percentages that near 100%. Uh, but in this particular instance, I'm confident when I say that 95% of our cases begin with some trafficker reaching out to the victim through Instagram, 
or through some other version of a messaging, electronic messaging means. And when we think back to COVID, and when we think back to the fact that many of our children were going to school on their computer, what that essentially created was the perfect atmosphere for traffickers to begin reaching out to young victims and luring them into this lifestyle. We'll discuss a little bit of what this recruitment process looks like. But again, I reiterate, when you have a crime that is completely dependent on electronic means of messaging, and you have the victims of those crimes uh, in front of those electronic means in record numbers, you can understand why we were seeing such a spike in young juveniles who were falling prey to these crimes. And we have seen that just continue. We have seen that continue over the course of even just this last year. At the task force, we put together a, a, a operation in January that was labeled uh, Better Pathways. And as part of this operation, there was times where we exclusively focused on recovering young juveniles from areas that were identified as hot spots of human trafficking. We did recover many juveniles, but one in particular stuck out in my mind because she was 13 years old. 13 years old. And when you think about the impact that this crime will have on that individual for the rest of that individual's life, um, it's, it's staggering. And so uh, we, have, we have continued to recover juveniles in record numbers. We just see that as a trend that, that, that we're hoping to stop. But uh, in light of some of these changes in the law, um, some, of, some of our abilities have been, uh, in many respects, uh, hamstrung. And so um, I don't want to give, uh, give away too much, but we'll go over that in a second. Um, You've, you've heard me discuss a lot about sexual exploitation already, and that is because that is the most common form of human trafficking. Sexual exploitation is the one we see the most of. And so uh, what we also know based on the trends that we've identified and, um, and things we've seen across the state and various reports that we have received from various parts of the state is California is a is a top four destination for this. And that's kind of hard to see. Um, and San Diego being a top 13 is even harder to see. But the reason behind this is, uh, is, is evident just geographically. Uh, we al align ourselves next to two states that many of these traffickers do a circuit through. And we've seen many victims who start in Sacramento and who are brought down to San Diego, to Los Angeles, then get moved over to uh, Las Vegas, then get moved over to Phoenix. We see traffickers doing this because we've identified the fact that they are trying to not stay in one area for too long so as to avoid a lot of attention both uh, to themselves and to the victim whom they know uh, is the key for us to be able to engage in our investigations especially when it involves a minor what we have learned is that they are more likely to move within these jurisdictions and move within these states more frequently so that that minor will still be reported as a runaway. If there is a minor that is contacted by law enforcement and that minor is already identified as a runaway in our system, uh, then they are more likely to be um, interviewed by police. They are more likely uh, to then be able to identify who is trafficking them and therefore the traffickers more likely to receive um, penalties under the law. And so they're doing that to avoid detection. Um, and when, when I tell you that there is this, uh, that I don't have a single case where the trafficker doesn't reach out first to the victim through some messaging system, 
you know, a lot of people always ask me, well, how does that first interaction look like? How does that contact look like? Because like I told you, we have traffickers who bring in victims from other states here. And so they may, for example, have someone in Dallas who they pay a flight to, to come to California. And then once here, they will traffic them here. And so that message, that initial message, I mean, it is, it, it, it was uh, surprising to me to say the least, the first time I kind of saw the interaction, it is so simple. It is a like of a photograph. And then maybe the victim likes the photograph back on the other end. The trafficker sends a message with his phone number or some more information, some more questions, and then that's it. It, it is that simple. I think, I, I suppose, being from an era where there wasn't Instagram initially, at least Facebook messengers, and we believe that these interactions between people require more than just a simple message. Um, you know, I, I found that to be surprising. But now I think the new generation of young, um, young adults, young children, they see this as such an automatic way of saying hello to someone and connecting with someone that it may ultimately end up uh, creating more victims of this. So to define trafficking here within the state of California, it is broken up into two separate categories. The first is the trafficking of an adult, which requires that a person's personal liberties be deprived through some use of force, fear, fraud, coercion. The way I think of that is, is that someone is being forced to do something. In the case of human trafficking, it is either being forced into sexual exploitation or into labor um, against their will through force, fear, fraud, or coercion. In the case of uh, the trafficking of a minor, um, that, that element of force, fear, and fraud, and coercion is not needed. Um, more, moreover, it's not even needed that the act be completed. In other words, that the trafficking be totally completed. An attempt to get a minor to do this type of, of uh, to, to engage in this conduct, uh, that alone is a criminal act. And so what we have seen here in California is there are obviously increased punishments for this. And I think it's it's great news to hear that uh, as recently as last week, uh, Senate Bill 14 did pass through the assembly. It had passed through the Senate unanimously and was held up in the assembly uh, public safety committee. Uh, they voted against making human trafficking of a minor a serious felony in the state of California, thereby denying us the ability to, uh, to charge that as a strike, as it is more colloquially referred to. The governor intervened, and uh, thankfully now we have the ability, and it's, it's not complete yet, but it sounds like it's headed in that direction, that this soon will be a serious uh, felony in the state of California. Um, I know, you know, sometimes we see passing, uh, like a, a law passing, and we think to ourselves, well, what effect can that possibly have on the crime itself? And, you know, let me assure you that that effect is, is great, because the message that is sent through our laws is then used or not used by traffickers to recruit victims. And you'll see what I mean by that. Um, just as I told you that there's not a lot of cases that I prosecute where the person hasn't uh, first been contacted by the trafficker through Instagram, well, there's just as many cases that I can think of that, that, that always involve gangs. Um, there's always an element of organized crime in these particular cases. And that is one of the first this is one of the first moments that I'm going to highlight to you the psychological component of this crime, because many of those principles that we are aware of that are very commonplace in a gang prosecution are found in the crime of human trafficking, in particular through the victim. When there is a particular neighborhood or a victim or a witness in a gang case, we know 
that that gang has intimidated that community, those witnesses, that victim, to the extent that many people do not want to cooperate with a potential prosecution, not just with the prosecution, however, but just merely having your name identified on a piece of paper is considered a capital offense within this subculture. So a piece of paper that can be that can fall into the hands of law enforcement is something that could put your life at risk when we're talking about gang crimes. Well, the exact same principle applies to human trafficking, especially when there's this gang nexus involved. Victims of human trafficking are not just fearful of reporting things to law enforcement. They are told by their traffickers that any cooperation with anyone, including doctors and nurses, can potentially lead to the police showing up and to the police becoming involved. And so this begins the first of two, I'd say, major psychological components to the victimization of these particular individuals through the crime of human trafficking. There's an element of fear. There's an element of, um, of distrust that is embedded into these victims by their traffickers in order to avoid the trafficker being detected. And so when we interact with these victims, it's going to be different than what we would normally anticipate. Uh, in my experience, it could, it could be in certain aspects, it could be hostile. Um, and so you, you need to be aware of that when you, uh, as, as uh, doctors and medical staff, um, when you are interacting with a victim of human trafficking, you need to be aware of that because uh, wherever there is a victim of human trafficking, there is a high degree of likelihood that the trafficker is nearby. And by interacting with them and maybe asking pointed questions without them necessarily sharing first, you place not only that victim in harm's way, but you could even potentially place yourself in harm's way. So something to note, uh, this psychological component of the crime itself. So let's talk a little bit about these key changes in the law. We're going to start with Title 42, and then we're going to head over to Senate Bill 357 here in California. When Title 42 first came out in March of 2020, um, it was really a way for US officials, at least the justification at that point was to turn away migrants who may be at the border in order to prevent a spread of COVID. In May of this year, that law has now been lifted. So no more Title 42, now it's Title 8. It returns back to what it used to be, meaning that they must apply for asylum when they reach the border. And so one of the things that uh, really was a concern when Title 42 went reverted back, so no longer was it Title 42, one of the biggest concerns that were raised was whether or not there would be an increase in human trafficking as a result of that now. And so this is where I want to highlight a key distinction between the crime of human trafficking and the crime of smuggling. The crime of human trafficking, as we went over just, uh, just a few slides ago, is a crime against a person, right? It, it is their personal liberty that is being infringed on, right? We think of the word trafficking. And in many respects, it's almost a misnomer because we, we hear the word trafficking and it automatically, in our mind, creates an image of movement, movement of an individual, either across state lines, either across jurisdictions, whatever it may be. Uh, in this particular instance, across countries, right? And so while that is present in the crime, trafficking Nothing in the crime requires movement. Nothing in the crime requires that. Many of the cases that I investigate and prosecute alongside many of the task force officers here uh, are exclusively happening within the county, not requiring any additional movement. 
Um, and so unlike smuggling, which can occur when someone brings someone across uh, the border. And while we have seen, and I've checked with my um, associate here who is a, a Homeland Security officer, I have checked with him, they have seen additional numbers of individuals coming. I've had that experience in, in, in a few cases myself, uh, but not in the realm of trafficking. Now that doesn't mean that it's not happening. I don't want you to think that, but you're gonna see in a few minutes now, previously we would, we would say that the crime of human trafficking is something that, a, that is difficult to spot sometimes. Sometimes now more particularly, that crime is becoming more and more open and notorious more and more open and notorious when it comes to what we see on the streets. The crime of labor trafficking, however, that one in particular, is one that is still difficult to find, difficult to spot. What I mean by that is we don't have many victims who report that. The main reason why we don't have that is because many of the victims who would be subject to that crime come from countries where there is already embedded in them a distrust in law enforcement. There is already embedded in them a feeling that what they're doing is wrong already, almost an element of uh, shame because they're in a country perhaps they're being lured in by someone either legally or in some cases illegally. And they're not uh, comfortable with reporting something to law enforcement because they fear what could potentially happen. In cases of individuals who uh, are here not legally, they're fearful of immigration consequences. We do our best to educate the communities. We do our best to go out there and, and train individuals so that they understand that as, as law enforcement, we, we are not here to deport anyone. We are not here. That is not our function. We are here to investigate crimes. We are here to investigate crimes regardless of status. And so that's why we don't see many of these crimes, many of these um, labor trafficking crimes. And that's why Title 42, while it did change the atmosphere as far as more individuals possibly coming here, it didn't really increase the amount of trafficking cases that we saw. What did affect the amount of trafficking cases that we are seeing is California Senate Bill 357. And that is probably, maybe it's not the first time anyone has heard of that, but a lot of the times it, it is. It was a bill that went, went by kind of unknown to many, but what it did was it decriminalized the crime of loitering with the intent to commit prostitution. And so just so that you are aware of what that is and what that looks like, when an individual who is seeking to purchase uh, sex is in an area, doing circles and circles and circles and circles and circles and circles, this, this would have been a crime before Senate Bill 357. It is no longer a crime now. And if this individual stops and speaks to a, 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 a victim and, or, or, or goes up to various victims, that person cannot be stopped by law enforcement anymore. There is the crime of engaging in the act of soliciting prostitution, but that pre-crime before someone is victimized is no longer on the books. And the other uh, thing that this created is that more and more we're seeing trafficking occurring at a, on a street level. I, I will tell you that that uh, operation that I brought up earlier today about uh, Operation Better Pathways, we found a 13 year old standing on the street at 2 a.m. in the morning because her trafficker made her stand out there in order to meet her quota. So this isn't 
something where, oh, it's just happening on the street. No one needs to, there are absolute victims who are minors being placed out on the street in the cold, in the rain. Uh, we have seen text messages between traffickers and victims that are absolutely insidious. When the trafficker is telling the victim to go out there despite the fact that the victim is on her period. It is insidious. And so what this bill has done is what I told you about earlier, which is the messaging behind this decriminalization. When we interviewed that 13-year-old, she was told by her trafficker that she thought what she was doing was legal in California now. Victims are telling us that, wait a minute, why, why am I, you know, what's going on here? You know, I thought this was all legal. And so the, the, this messaging is being used by traffickers to convince young women that this is the type of life that they could lead and make money in. And so this is what we've seen. And just to highlight for you just how much of an issue it is. I'm gonna show you a few photographs now. These photographs are two in the morning, two in the morning in an area that is completely non-residential. It is a business area. It is found in uh, South San Diego, and it is an area that we have seen a absolute dramatic increase in trafficking, sexual exploitation. And a big reminder, this is when none of these businesses are open. And so I'm going to, it's it's almost going to be kind of like a flip book. I'll flip it back and forward, back and forward so you can see it rather than embedding a video here, which is always a precarious thing to do in PowerPoint. Um, I kind of took little snippets of it for you to see. Now we'll go backwards. So just by looking at these photos, you can already see just this one alone, the amount of cars there at two in the morning, the amount of people out and these two individuals wearing white, the video uh, shows them accosting these various groups of women. Uh, we have uh, seen videos of uh, of traffickers attempting to run over their victims in a car. We have seen videos of traffickers be violent uh, with these victims. Um, and this is not just happening in San Diego. This is across the state. When I speak to my counterparts at the Attorney General's office, they have reported an increased number of this type of out in just open and notorious conduct. They have seen that across the state. In Sacramento, they have had to, in an effort to stop this from happening, they have had to shut down actual streets. They have had to close them off from cars to hopefully not have the type of conduct that is depicted in these photographs. In Los Angeles, there has been an increased number of robberies, armed crimes uh, occurring in a, in a particular hot zone happening in, in Los Angeles. Here in San Diego, we have this area that is found in, in, in South San Diego that abuts National City. And so it really is an area between two jurisdictions. And at the task force, since we are able to look at everything across the county, more importantly, we have a, you know, affiliates of National City and of San Diego PD. So we are able to investigate this type of conduct, this type of crime and and, and really hold the traffickers accountable. But when we look at those things, 
that have affected human trafficking, that have increased human trafficking, this is this bill. We didn't see this before this bill. We did not see this before this bill. This wasn't this heavily trafficked at 2 a.m. in the morning. And if and if you see it on a Friday, you I mean it, it is shocking. It is shocking. And we are no longer able to engage in many investigations because sometimes when we were interacting with a victim, we were able to at least obtain their phone. Remember, the one mean that they have to communicate with their trafficker by detaining them briefly under this particular code section of the penal code, 653.22, which was now eliminated thanks to Senate Bill 357. And so we are, no, we are now limited in our ability to do that. We have found ways to adapt, obviously, but our, our, a tool in order to hold traffickers accountable was removed from our ability to, uh, to investigate these crimes. And so this is really one of the most substantial changes that we have seen uh, that has just spiked this type of crime uh, out in the open. And what we've seen now is the this exploitation, this is what we would colloquially refer to as a track or a blade. What we see is traffickers not just forcing their victim to stand out there, rain, shine, cold, hot, whatever. We see a trafficker who not just makes the victim stand out there, but at the same time, simultaneously is placing advertisements online through websites, adult websites like Mega Personals. And they are uh, advertising their victim through that so that if they get a date on that, the trafficker begins interacting with the buyer, tells the victim to return back to the hotel room where she engages in, in, in sexual acts with the buyer in exchange for money and right back out to the street. And so uh, it is out in the open, at least down there. Uh, and what we have seen is that our victims are from all walks of life, young, old. The people buying are from all walks of life. And really that is the crime that we need to really focus on. Because if we want to eliminate this, we need to focus on the biggest problem, which is these individuals who are out there buying this. So the when we we, we conducted a study here in San Diego about how the uh, how these traffickers recruit victims. I mentioned to you kind of that very that quick exchange that could occur on Instagram, but what we have seen a little bit more of is a uh, you know a recruitment that occurs through females, females working for traffickers who then go out and recruit um, other females. Um, what we have seen sometimes is that when young women are placed in facilities, sometimes they will go look for other young women while in the facilities if they're placed in there because for example they you know they're a dependent they will recruit other individuals while inside come outside and bring them to the trafficker and so to the extent that if you have that type of uh, facility that you 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 could recognize that that is so important to potentially prevent further victimization of a young uh, of a young victim um, but we have seen recruitment occur at the college level. We have seen recruitment occur under the guise of uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. The, the victims will refer to as, as love bombing, which is when initially uh, they meet the trafficker, the trafficker buys them nice things, takes them out to nice dinners, uh, promises them a life that is beyond what they have right now, financially, um, just, you know, environmentally different than what they have right now. And, um, and these victims believe that that is a possibility. You know, the trafficker continues to lure them by saying, oh, well, you know, um, uh, it, once we make this much money, we'll be able to get out of this. And then you make that much money and then, well, it's this much money. 
and then we'll get a car and it's all going to the trafficker. It's all going to them. And so um, once the trafficker finishes this kind of phase that the, 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 the victims will refer to as love bomb, that is when they propose, hey, why don't you just do this for one, you know, just one time, just, you know, go out there and, and do this for me one time. We need, we need some money now. I've been paying the rent for about a month. You got to kind of uh, do your part too. And it begins that way. And this is that second psychological component to this crime. We talked about gains. We talked about the fear of reporting to law enforcement, cooperating with those who may be affiliated or associated with law enforcement. The other psychological component to this is almost an element of domestic violence. Because in many of these cases, our victims love their trafficker. And that may seem like something that is totally foreign to us and totally um, just in total dissonance with what we would leave this crime would create in a victim, but based on the grooming that occurs and um, and the way that this crime transfolds, the recruiting of this crime, we see many of our victims who love and want to protect the person who is victimizing them. And so that is why this is a this is a complex uh, trauma that these victims suffer because they are being forced in two ways. They can't, they, they don't want to report because they're fearful of what can happen to them. Sometimes they're conflicted because they don't want to report because for them it's emotional. It's emotional to now suddenly turn their back on this person. Um, and we've seen that. We've seen that in interviews with victims where they're crying and not wanting to tell us who's doing this to them. Um, and so it, it, it's, that's, you know, it's 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 important to know that, to understand the trauma that they're coming from. But it's precisely, you know, the, the, the victimization is something that these traffickers, they know how to pick their victim. They, they are uh, isolating individuals for this type of victimization because they know that a person with less of a structure at home or less of a support group will hopefully likely rely on them as a support group. Um, now that's not always the case. Um, I, 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 again, what we talked about earlier, the percentages and everything, more likely than not, these will be key risk factors that you will find in a victim. But I don't want to suggest to you that there is not that, there are not victims that don't have these risk factors. We had a case where we had a victim who was in college, who was from a wonderful family, who wasn't necessarily addicted to drugs or alcohol, just became involved with a, with a boyfriend and the boyfriend did this, just like we talked about earlier, just kind of started luring her in, love bombing and then asking her to do this. And then they began making money and um, he took all that money um, and, and, and recruited younger and younger and younger females. And when she wanted to leave, he would not let her and he would threaten her. And, uh, and she, similar to these domestic violence cases where the, there's almost a codependence created financially, she became dependent. And she was fearful and ashamed of kind of now who she was. And she didn't want to report out of that shame. And so I don't want you to think that, um, you know, it's not possible for, for these risk factors to not be present. Um, so when you're now in a healthcare setting, how could you possibly... You know, what type of indicators can you look for in a victim of human trafficking? Um, the most common one are multiple cell phones. But I want to highlight something about the cell phones. A weird cell phone. A weird cell phone. What do I mean by that? A 22-year-old female, an 18-year-old female, 17-year-old female with a flip 
phone. That is an indicator. Because what we have seen is that traffickers know that we build our investigations off of cell phones. And so what traffickers sometimes do is they will give a burner phone, a phone specifically designated for this crime to be engaged to their victim. And they don't let them have their cell phone. And there's only one contact in that cell phone, and it's the trafficker. And so if you see, I mean, who, what, what, I mean, all of us, as a, even as an adult, very rarely will you ever see a flip phone in, in the hands of a person. But if you see someone with multiple cell phones, but more importantly, if you see someone with a flip phone, that's already a red flag. We have seen that on more than one occasion. That's already a red flag. Um, obviously, if there's someone present there that does not want to leave, I know I don't need to tell you guys this, but you know that is certainly uh, that that's just not an indicator of human trafficking. That could be an indicator of something else, a very controlling partner. But that is again, remember that psychological component. This sometimes kind of has an uh, an air of domestic violence to it. Um, if they don't have IDs, sometimes they don't carry their ID. Uh, sometimes they don't want to share their personal information, like what their address is. And in those cases where it is um, severe, I would say, uh, we do see branding. We do see tattoos. And the tattoos are very specific. I have a few photos here um, that can, can, you know, obviously a name is something, but I recognize that people can get you know, a tattoo of someone else's name on them and not necessarily be involved in this. But what I want to highlight for you consistently throughout this is that there are uh, not just tattoos, but there are other symbols such as the crown. Um, in this particular um, subculture, the trafficker is seen as a king. And, you know, what he says goes. And so this is often depicted in tattoos with, um, you know, uh, crowns or money symbols. Um, these are some of the, just to show you kind of what I mean by the crowns and stuff. These are some of the tattoos that you'll see on a trafficker now, right? Um, and so, you know, one of the most, uh, the ones that kind of strike me here, um, uh, are the top left one, money over bitches. Um, then the bottom right one, loyalty brings royalty. And so these are the ones that kind of further identify for you just what this psychological component of, of this crime really is for, for our victims. Um, so what to do when um interacting with a victim of human trafficking so there's a few things to remember there are a few things to remember i told you earlier that it is a crime against a person right that someone's personal liberties have been deprived what is the most important personal liberty that we have all of us the freedom of choice we get the right to choose what we want to eat that day we get the right to choose where we want to go, who we want to be with. Those choices are not available to a victim of human trafficking. They are simply not there. And it was something that I, you know, obviously the law, when you read it is one thing and when you see it is something else. I had a victim of, of trafficking who thankfully she is now out of this life she is doing very well. But when I first met her, I asked her, you know, you know, very late, what do you want to eat? And we just recovered her. And she says, you know, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to eat something. How about Jack in the Box? And I go, Jack in the Box, of everything available in life, you want Jack in the Box. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I want Jack in the Box because it's my favorite. And he would never let me have it. He would never let me get any of it because he knew it was my favorite. And so 
when you think about how simple of a choice that is to say, I want to go to Jack in the Box today, and you can't, that's not your choice anymore. That's what we're talking about here when we are interacting with a victim. This person may have been deprived of food. This person may have been deprived of sleep. Their hours are, the, the hours that the trafficker puts them out there are outrageous. It is, it could be eight hours of straight standing in the middle of the night. Um, and so they are, keep in mind, skeptical of help. They come from, in many cases, uh, broken homes or the foster system where anytime anyone has helped them, it's never ever really ended up helpful for them. So they could be skeptical. And like I told you before, there is a, a, a they, they feel that there is a stigma associated with them. They feel like, well, I, what am I going to do after I've done this? Like, how, how can I be a productive member of society? I've been, you know, I've had one victim tell me I'm tainted. What can I do? What, what, what's left for me? Um, and so they feel very isolated and alone. And so some of the best things, you know, well, before we even get to the best things that you can do, one of the most important things to keep in mind is that many of these victims return to that life. And what we need to be mindful of is that it takes seven times, I'm not, you know, the number isn't magical or anything, it could be less, obviously, but uh, on average, it takes about seven times for a victim to have a positive interaction with the system before they consider turning away from this life or turning away from their trafficker. And so the reason for that is that we just need to be a positive and welcoming and, and non-judgmental person to a victim. We need to, you know, I put up here, don't try. The reason I say that is because sometimes, you know, when I meet with victims, I don't wear this outfit. They see me wearing this and they'll laugh me right out the door. I just be real with them. I don't talk to them about what's going on. I try to look around, see what's going on, try to understand the situation and, you know, talk about something else with them. And eventually they, on their terms, come out and tell you once you've gained their trust. They will tell you what's going on. Um, I want to highlight a note about uh, mandated reporting here because I've I've had it in more than one case that it stems from a hospital setting. Our our report first and foremost, as I as I give you some some numbers here. Um, first and foremost, when you call nine one one, if you have to report based on your mandatory reporting requirements. Um, if you call 911, the task force will be going. Every jurisdiction understands that when someone has identified an issue of human trafficking, be, be, be mindful of the fact that you must say human trafficking. Every jurisdiction within San Diego knows that the task force needs to come out. Why that's beneficial to you because of the, 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 the mandatory reporting requirement is that someone that is not in uniform will come. So sometimes our victims of human trafficking do not want us to report things to the cops, correct? So when guys come in big, you know, outfits and, you know, badges and everything, that will freak a lot of people out. That freaks a lot of people out. And so we, when we respond, we come in plain clothes. We speak colloquially. We don't come in like flashing badges, making a big scene. We understand what a position, what position we're placing the victim in. And we, and many times the trafficker is legitimately waiting outside in a vehicle. And so uh, I want to highlight that because another note for you to take for this is you may have to train staff like security about these dynamics because as they're, you know, you don't, you certainly don't want to deny a patient the fact that they want someone present in the room. However, if you have identified that that individual present in the room is their trafficker, 
what does what what does that now create? And so uh, your staff, your security should be mindful of that. It could be dangerous for somebody to just go get out of here for a, a trafficker. My, being mindful that many of these individuals are members of of a gang and could potentially be armed. So it is best for you to call us. We are a hundred percent ready to handle these situations. And we are 100% on call at all hours. And so that is, you know, the benefit of this county. We have a, I mean, I am absolutely humbled by the work that this task force does. It is absolutely incredible. I feel like a small piece of this ginormous uh, group and system uh, that we have in place here to do the best we can to, to, to rid ourselves of this type of crime in our county. I leave for you a few more numbers there um, of resources that could be afforded. Um, we have the bilateral safety corridor, which is located in the South Bay and the North County Lifeline, which is no, located in the North. That way, if there's a victim in either of those jurisdictions, those resources are nearer to them. So I know I'm reached my time here, so I want to be mindful of that and your lunch hour. And I want to thank each of you for your time and uh, allowing me to speak to you here. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, that's all for me. Thank you very much for that amazingly informative talk, uh, which was also incredibly disturbing. We'll go ahead and open it up. If you have any questions, please either put them in the chat or raise your hand. And I, while we're waiting for that, I will go ahead and, and start off. Um, I just want to make sure you know that the the majority of the participants in today's meeting are working in the pre-hospital setting. So we have paramedics and EMTs uh, responding oh. to 911 calls. And there are some hospital-based people as well. But I'm wondering when you talk about um, responding, you know, sometimes frequently, probably with these patients, they would refuse transport against medical advice. Mm -hmm. Do you also have the ability to respond to the, the scene of a 911 call oh. or more in a hospital setting? And then also coupled with that, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, and let the, the team here know about AB 128 in terms of the um, reporting requirements and whether paramedics and EMTs would be included in the uh, people affected by AB uh, 1028, uh, no longer requiring the mandatory reporting uh, for domestic violence. Over to you. Okay, so let's start uh, one at a time. And, I, and I'm sorry, I just realized that you had um, included here in the chat as well, Dr. Koenig, the uh, what percentage of victims are women versus men. So let me go all those three. So first, the percentages. The majority of our um, victims are, are, are female. Uh, we actually just had our very first case involving a male victim, three of them. And uh, that is, I mean, there are some people who've been in this task force for over 10 years and they hadn't seen a male victim. And so um, that was our very first case involving one. Again, not to say that that is never going to be the case, just to suggest that uh, primarily the victims are female. Um, as far as reporting out to the scene, um, that is something that we regularly do. 100%, like 100% we're there. We are doing um, a lot of our investigations stem from a 911 call that is out in the scene. And so we've had cases where we respond to, you know, a victim of human trafficking, for example, sees an opportunity to uh, go to uh, a hotel and steps to the front teller and says, I'm being trafficked, please call 911. Done. And that's where we respond as well. So the source of the response can also, uh, it could be just out in the scene. Now, Assembly Bill 1028, um, it's funny enough that you mentioned that, Bill. I I don't know if this is, you know, uh, the right forum to, you know, but to discuss, but I, I, my opinions on that bill are, you know, I don't know if it's if it's a good thing. I, but I also recognize that within, um, you know, the, it puts it puts um, medical staff in a tough position in a tough position when they're 
in one on one hand trying to gain the trust of a patient and on the other hand almost seemingly violating the trust of them by disclosing what has been told to a medical professional to law enforcement but I can't even tell you the amount of times we've been able to save a life through that same environment. And so I don't remember the, uh, I have it actually written up because I did a little write up on this particular bill, but it was a long list um, that, uh, oh, there we go. You've heard DA Stefan speak in opposition. Oh, perfect. Well, then maybe there we go. <laughs> um, but there is a long list of crimes that would be affected by this. And um, it is broadly defined so that, you know, I, I could see it encompassing human trafficking and not creating, you know, a, an obligation to report that, I, especially, you know, that especially when it involves minors, that's that's challenging to me, but it will it will impact this as well. Um, I do have a list, but I you know, I'd rather make sure I answer all your guys' questions, but I do recall it being a long list of crimes that when you, you read through it, you go, man, if you don't report that, what, what are we doing? Um, but, you know, that, that will certainly, I think, it, I think human trafficking could be interpreted to be on there. Um, what would the ETA of the task force do a call in North County? Um, so kind of, it, it, in certain um, in certain contexts, if it will take us some time to get to a location, a there may be an officer that comes out. There may be an officer that comes out and holds the scene as it is for us to make it. Um, we had a call out the other day, and I think it took us about remember because it's got to go nine one one nine one one to the 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 agency that oversees the area agency that oversees the area identifies that it's a trafficking calls us personally and then we go out there and so we had one in the south bay and we got there within 20 to 25 minutes thank you very much i'm not seeing any hands or any other questions i'll just ask one more because i was very interested in how you said this all started with social media and more <laughs> online after COVID. Are you in the task force looking at potential effects of AI chat GPT on, on human trafficking? Not yet. Not yet. We have not had any any situation involving AI or chat GPT in that in that respect. Thank you. I, it, it, I, how, how can we help in our community, uh, you know, pre-hospital community? Is there something more we can do to, to help you do your work? Your eyes and observations are paramount, paramount. And, um, you know, by the time we get there, there may be efforts made to, you know, uh, the, either through the trafficker or even in some cases reminding of that of that psychology behind the, the trafficker and the victim. There could be efforts to hide behaviors. There could be efforts to hide evidence by the time we get there. So your eyes are paramount to us. And so what, it, what you observe and the things that you hear are really going to help us more than than anything. So yeah. Or a, I have a follow-up question about whether, is there a perception in your circles about whether the EDs or EMS is not doing enough or, or as is a missed opportunity? Not at all. Not, uh, not at all. Uh, I've had a case uh, where we had two uh, victims that were hospitalized for some time. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that they handled that situation I mean, it was fantastic. You know, I think that we're blessed in this county because everyone understands and recognizes what this issue is, and uh, everyone is willing to do their part. And it takes truly uh, a, an entire village and county to do their part in order to to prevent this crime. And, and I think every single person that I've interacted with, and I've interacted with so many agencies, so many institutions, there has been such a spirit of cooperation that, you know, I, I mean, 
people, when they get subpoenaed for these cases, folks, I know you guys don't like that word, but when people get subpoenaed for these cases, it is, I, I've never met more cooperative witnesses. And so uh, that's really a blessing in this county. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more comments or questions. Uh, we will definitely uh, post your lecture and make sure people pay close attention to the signs that should make them sus uh, suspect. And also the resources that you provided were extremely helpful. So thank you very, very much. Uh, we really appreciate your, your time and helping us to understand this uh, horrific crime a bit better. Thank you, everyone.